So I'm going to be your guide to science. I'm not an advocate. I do have an EPA badge on, but I'm here for the partnership. What I want to lay out is the tremendous 30 plus years of science we have, and how does that match up with the expectations for a market-based program, connect that up to accountability, and then you be the judge of, do we have the understanding at the small scale to the large scale to support what's happening out here as well? But as doing that, what I want to be sure is, this is the acknowledgments for one document of hundreds out there that we're depending on. This is the uh, 2003 Chesapeake Bay Water Quality Criteria. Hundreds of partners are contributing, in this case, to defining a clean Chesapeake Bay. The science you're going to see here is not EPAs, it's not just USGS, it's land-grant universities, it's agribusiness, it's conservation districts. It's a tremendous amount drawn together, packaged up by this partnership, and then put to use for your all's use and for the entire partnership as well. So keep that in mind. Again, it's not my science, your science, it's our collective science that's out there. So let's answer the question. Do you got science? Boy, do we have that. Let's lay it out in the context of how does that factor into a market-based program? Does it give us the confidence that we can put these, this, this kind of an approach to, to bear, protect local streams, protect the Chesapeake, and get the job done smarter and, and cheaper? So what I did is I looked, stepped back and looked at market-based programs and what do they need from a science perspective? Well, you need to understand the sources, what their pollutant loads are out there. You need to understand the hundreds, which I'll show you, of practices, treatments, technologies that could be put in place out there. What is their pollution reduction potential? How do those pollutants move from that edge of field? Yes, from that back end of that cow, from that stream segment out there, from that wastewater treatment plant, from that pristine forest, which gets its share of pollution from air. How does that move into the system? How does it go into local streams and rivers, into the groundwater, and eventually end up in somebody's backyard, um, on the Chesapeake itself, and in a tidal creek, et cetera? And then can you connect back up to those watershed loads so we can complete that circle and have confidence? So we're going to walk through examples of our science to get at each one of these different aspects. First and foremost, people are concerned, do I know where those sources are? I just spent two days up in Windsor, Ontario, talking to folks working on Lake Erie. You figure that the lakes, you know, they've been looking at these issues for as long as we have. Folks, we are in darn good shape here in the Chesapeake Bay. Yes, they've got issues like we do as well, but we've got an understanding of our sources. In this case, over four, 469 or 68 municipal wastewater and industrial wastewater facilities. These are the big guys to the medium-sized guys. By the end of 2018, each and every one of them is going to have its own individual nitrogen phosphorus permit limit. It's going to ha and most of them are actually going to be achieving what we want under the Bay TMDL itself. So we know them up there. We're going to turn our attention to those 5,215 non-significant facilities. Maryland's already moving there. Virginia's moving there. Pennsylvania's moving there. So these are less than 400,000 gallons per day. We know where they're located, and we're getting better and better information about this. This is from dry cleaners to small um, you know, trailer park homes, treatment systems out there as well. So we're digging down deep. So we know where our wastewater is. We've got the system to, to look at it. And then we can track each and every one of those sources to a local stream. And as I'll show you, eventually to where it hits into the Chesapeake Bay itself. So we got that source covered. The key one is ag, urban, et cetera out there. So what you're looking at here is, look at that 30 meter resolution. Our fifth generation of modeling tools, that's the scale at which we've been looking at land cover, land use out out there. Certainly we have better information. We're Lee Curry co-chairing uh, the Partnerships Modeling Work Group with Dave Montali with West Virginia. We're going to that one meter resolution. Look at the difference between the two of those. What that gives us is more confidence that we know where those lands are, where those farms are located, not individual farms and parcels. Sorry, Trey, we're not going to be looking at yours. But we'll have that information along with our land-grant universities, urban systems, to understand on that landscape where the sources are, where they are currently, and as you put practices on place, what that's going to change that out of its time. So the tools, the capacity that we have is going to increase greatly um, over the coming years within this larger partnership. So we'll have a, even a better understanding of what's happening on that landscape out there than we've ever had before. Do we have BMPs? These are not the BMPs. These are the 80 categories in which we categorize what the partnership has agreed. And that is we use um, science coming from our land-grant universities, science from coming all around the world, and experts in each of these fields to determine what that BMP is, what its definition is, and most important for you all here, 
What is its nitrogen and phosphorus reduction potential? So remember that one? You guys, old folks in the back there, you can see the rating. Here's the list. Right now, we're at 368 practices. Stormwater, agri in the agricultural sector, in the forestry sector, in the stream restoration, wetlands. We're even looking at oysters right now. We're looking at manure technologies. The list goes on and on and on. And given the time that uh, Sarah would put me in the back, I'd have to do 11 more slides to show you there. So one of the concerns I've heard out there is, you're not crediting my practice. You don't, you know, you're not looking at my bioinfiltration bio system. You're not looking at my oyster uh, aquaculture effort. You're not looking at my silviculture piece. Folks, by the end of this year, we'll have over 400 individual practices that the partnership, coll us collectively, have agreed to. We've got 20 different uh, expert panels underway and coming forward as well. So we will have that covered. If there's a practice we're missing, we have a system in place for bringing that science in there as well. So we're in good shape, probably the best in the country, having had been fortunate to, to go on across this country and go on a little bit around the world. No one has this understanding and drawn the science and gotten the agreement on practice by practice by practice. Is it perfect? No. We've gone three rounds on riparian forest buffers because the science has improved. Cover crops, the same thing. We're understanding new treatment technologies and approaches for urban stormwater. We're going to continue to bring them in. Uh, if there's a science base for doing that, we can work it through the partnership. So we can really check off, do we understand the pollutant reduction potential for the actions we can put on the land? So you take those, you put it across this, this fifth version of the Chesapeake Bay, what we call the watershed model. Think of a huge accounting system that takes and, and basically knows where us 18 million people are across that watershed where our agricultural production areas are, where our forest lands are, and then accounts for where that is and where, where the local streams and rivers are. So if you took all the practices that were, were uh, re reported by the six states in the District of Columbia, by our conservation districts, our counties, our municipalities and townships to the north, and you raid those and you said, hey, listen, what are the local streams seeing reduction-wise because of those practices? The darker that brown color, you guys on the eastern shore, two thumbs up. Folks in the Shenandoah, you can see it. You can see other places out there. Here's our best scientific understanding of, of those practices when they're put in place and they're transported through surface water or groundwater to the nearest stream. That's what the system looks like. You need that accountability. So you need to understand what that practice is, where it's being put in place, what its pollution reduction potential is as well. But that's not the whole story. But we've got tools, and they're getting better over this, this coming year, and you all will have an opportunity to review those tools, take a look at them and say, am I comfortable or not? Because we've got to then not only transport that, that load up to that particular system, as you go up in here, we need to better understand the biosolids, the fertilizer, the manure, where the applications are out there. So we've been working with our land-grant universities, our conservation districts, to get that input data better getting a bit more precise to Kent County and to, to, uh, to Washington County, et cetera. Then as we, we've got a system that then takes that, and then here's where we start to apply our, our, our practices. Nutrient management. If it's in good place out there, we understand what acreage is, what tier level that that's at. That starts to get factored in there. We apply it onto the land. We, we uh, add some rain to it, and given what's happened at that climate out there, we've got precipitation patterns that have got to be factored in there. We're doing that. Then you continue to do that. It goes through our riparian force buffer, or through a filter strip, or through a cover crop. We've got that accounted for. Then we've got the ability to bring it down into the streams in here. And then most, that's where most folks stop. They said, hey, listen, I've reduced it at a, at a treatment plan. I've reduced it running off of a, of a street or a farm. We've actually got, when we go into streams, look at your counties, look at your watershed organizations. Folks are going in there. They're restoring streams. They're changing the uh, our shore the hardening of our shorelines to more living shorelines. We've got that captured. We've got a panel actually looking at oyster aquaculture and the ability of oysters to, to uh, absorb nutrients. Is that a potential practice? So in the, in the Chesapeake Bay region, not un, you know, unlike most of the rest of the country, we can, our BMPs continue into the water itself, into the streams, and eventually into the Chesapeake Bay. That was, you just got a 101 on how models work in a very simple place. What we are now is, have been focusing on is getting better science at each one of those steps from the amount of manure or atmospheric deposition of biosolids and how it works through that system, improving the science so we've got comfort level to do the following. And that is, if you're in the Chesapeake Bay and you're in the main stem of the Chesapeake, sorry, I'm just a there, but you're in the middle part of the, the Chesapeake and the 
Lower Potomac. The areas that are in red are not Republicans and Democrats, how they're going to vote next year. That is, pound for pound, if you're up in the mighty Susquehanna on the Eastern Shore, you have a much larger influence on Chesapeake Bay between the Bay Bridge and the Potomac than everyone else does. That doesn't mean Virginia down there in the, in the blue area, um, down in this, this area, doesn't mean they get to get away with it. They influence the, the James River. But what this has done is it's drawn all the science together, understanding of where those sources are, not the bigger sources, but where those sources are relative to each other, so that if you're in the, in the Chesapeake Bay, in the middle of it down in here, get back in here, in here, this area of, of uh, Pennsylvania into New York, along the shore and a little bit of the western shore, has the most influence on you. So what we have now, with given all the science out there, we can say what parts of the watershed influence what river systems the most. So imagine taking that map, and if you live on the Chop Tank or in the Nanticoke, or if you're down in the Lower Potomac, or if you're up in the Severn, we would be able to create a different map that says who of your upstream neighbors are influencing you the most. The important piece to the market-based trading, uh, market-based approaches is we now understand and we can connect what parts of the watershed are influencing whose downstream waters out there so that there, there's concern about, hey, listen, if I trade from this system to this system, I'm going to create an imbalance out there. Well, we've got the ability to understand, is that, does that really make a difference, or do we need to then figure out eventually that particular part of the system needs more help as well? So let me take that and give you a couple of examples to then show our science with a fair amount of confidence. It's not perfect, but it is good and solid. Could do the following. So let's, uh, let's focus on Virginia down here. So given the size of these bars, that means this is the lower Rappahannock, that it the higher that, bar, higher that bar is, the more that people in the, in the Rappahannock watershed are influencing their own water quality conditions. So that the, uh, the mighty Susquehanna, um, which is over here, has a small influence, the uh, western shore, Patuxent, Potomac, York River, et cetera. So if you're in the Rappahannock, you've really, it's really, you've got to work on uh, what you need to do in there. This information can help us in Virginia then say, how much can they trade within and outside the Rappahannock without influencing Rappahannock water quality? We move up into the Eastern Bay. Um, huge amount is still because of the Eastern Bay, but look, you gotta, you gotta work with those guys in the, in the Susquehanna, the Western Shore, a little bit smaller amount down here onto the James itself. So the Eastern Bay, a good portion of it is yourself, but probably about half of it, you've gotta depend on your other neighbors. How do we use this in market-based programs? It allows us to then say, hey listen, how can we set up trading? How do, can we ensure that Eastern Bay is going to still have its water quality return due to it. At the same time, how can we use the strength of that market to, in fact, allow others to help get, get us along the way as well? But if you're in, in the, um, the Potomac itself, you got uh, a good portion of it, but you're also influenced by the Susquehanna, the Western Shore, the Patuxent, a little bit on the Rappahannock. You're depending a little bit on your Virginia colleagues and Eastern Shore as well. So given the Potomac, it's got a lot more sources um, with it itself, but it also, given that exchange to that lower mouth, a lot of other people around the Bay Watershed have an influence as well. So again, the science is there to understand river by river, in the tidal waters, looking upstream, who's influencing me, and how do we need to be sure that if we're trading within a basin, we're probably okay. If we're trading between basins, we shouldn't be concerned about that because we have the ability to understand, are we then upsetting that apple cart, or are the, those trades balancing each other out as well? It's tremendous, but it's built off of 30 plus years of science and monitoring and research to, to get us to this particular point. So let me then go through the accountability, then wrap up at the end here. So accountability, you think of, okay, I've got the science, um, so what else do I need? I need to be sure I've got a clear science-based goal at the end there that I'm working for, that I know how I'm going to measure that goal, that I can connect pollutant reductions that are out there to achieving that particular goal, and that I'm holding my, my partners accountable to being sure that they're putting on the ground what they're saying, that practice is, in fact, making the reductions necessary. So let's briefly walk through that. First and foremost, we've got a very clear, laid-out definition of what a clean Chesapeake Bay is. It's not John Smith or, or Pocahontas, um, it, Chesapeake Bay out there. No, it is good science that Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and Delaware work with their Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New York colleagues more than a decade ago. It's into state water quality standards, and to date, 10, 15 years later, nobody has sued the states, nobody has sued EPA over this definition of clean water. So we know what rockfish need, 
We also know what clams and, and worms down on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay need. So we got a good solid definition of, of healthy Chesapeake Bay. Um, so that's a given. We're fortunate to have one of the world's best monitoring systems out place and across the, the, uh, across the entire world out there. In the rivers themselves, we've got 120 stations uh, monitored by state partners, by river basin commissions, by USGS, by universities, all integrated together so that we can look at that data the same thing. And then over to your, your right-hand side, we've got 161 stations that we've been monitoring, um, not 24-7, but for 30-plus years now. So we've got decades worth of understanding how our rivers and streams and how the Chesapeake Bay is at. And these are our ultimate measures of not models, not number of practices, are our streams, our rivers, our Chesapeake Bay, are they running cleaner and are they giving the clean water that we want for fish, for kayaking, for, for drinking water, et cetera. But we're also seeing some, some significant trends out there and we can take a look at, as we move into market-based approaches, we can confirm, are we seeing the right continue the right directions for, for water quality. So what you're seeing is USGS's at 80 of the stations that have got at least a 15 to 20 year record. Um, but key over here, so if you're in the green side, that means pound for pound, your watershed has been losing weight. It's been losing, um, it has less and less nutrients coming off that particular system. So it's getting healthier and healthier. The higher the bar, the more weight that that watershed has lost over time. If you're on this other side in the, in the orange, that means you've actually been gaining some weight. You've been putting too much nutrients in that system. Most of those bars are green. Most of them are heading in the right direction. Eventually, within the next several years, we're going to have 120 of those weight measures. So watershed by watershed, up in there, we understand where the trends are heading. We can continue to watch to be sure that our choices, market-based and otherwise, are not impacting our ability to get local water quality conditions and others as well. Again one of the best, most comprehensive monitoring networks really in place for decade scale at a wat large watershed across the world at our fingertips here. And then down in the tidal waters, given that 161 station, and we've had colleagues from Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Maryland Department of the Environment, our colleagues in Virginia, universities out there in hurricanes and droughts, et cetera, taking samples at 161 stations. We have millions of data points at your fingertips to understand it. What you're seeing here is those millions of data points all combined together to take a look at how we're doing towards meeting how much oxygen we need, water clarity for underwater grasses, less harmful algal blooms, how healthy is that system. Looking be much better in terms of our open water habitats, think in terms of rockfish and bluefish and others. If you move down into spot and croaker territory, oyster territory, oranges, not there yet. You're down in the deep channel areas where, we, where you've, if you're a crab or a, a a spot, you're going to go down there for a meal. We're not there yet. But we have the ability as well to take every creek, every river, every part of the main stem in the Chesapeake Bay and look at it in context of are we making progress towards the level of water quality that's necessary out there. So we can continue to check along the way our, not only our watershed implementation plans but our market-based programs. Are they giving us the results necessary? Is there an imbalance? We can correct it. If not, we can proceed. We have the final check here and that's in our, our, our monitoring data. And then finally, um, this partnership is heading for its sixth generation um, of modeling systems out there. So that from the, the, the late 1970s, we've been building science, we've been building understanding of air. In, in other words, air from China is coming over to the US, but we've been cleaning it up here in the US and China's finally get there as well. We've got an airshed model that captures that. We've captured with the help of our USGS colleagues, changes in land use over the past 50 years and the ability to now project out 20, uh, 20, 30 years out there. We have the ability to put together scenarios. We've been talking about the watershed model, the accounting, but we can also look at oysters and oyster harvest in Menhaden out there as well. So we have the ability to organize the science. These are not black boxes. They are tools that we can collectively use to make it happen. But we train and we, we keep these tools honest by 30, 40 years worth of monitoring data out there real stream-based measurements of oysters out there, measurements of underwater grasses goes into what we've got here as well. There are tools. They also can help and, and support market-based kind of approaches out there, but they are always continue to be backed up by, by monitoring data on the system. And then finally, the partnership, similar to what you heard from the Maryland secretaries, all six states in the district, all our federal partners and others have embraced. We've got to understand, if I'm putting a practice in place, I need to verify it's, it's still there and it's functioning. Otherwise, that farmer 
that municipality, that non-governmental organization that put real dollars out of their own pockets, that put public funding in there, that investment went to waste if we don't ensure that it's doing what it needs to do for clean water, for good drinking water, for your, your downstream neighbors as well. So we've got a, a, a basin-wide system in place in which Maryland is leading the effort in, in making that connection um, farm by farm, city by city as they work it through there. And we've got, again, cabinet-level secretaries from across all six states in the district agreeing to, we got to watch these practices through their whole life cycle. That when they're under contract, when they've been, been put in place because a producer said it's, it's the right thing, as you heard from Trey out there, um, and if it's at the end of its lifespan but it's still being effective out there, we have a system for ensuring that it, it will continue to do its work out there. And then finally, this is where I put my EPA hat back on there, and there's one of the roles that the partnership has agreed to, and that is with this accountability system, EPA, since we have six states, we have over 1,600 local governments out there, you need to be the one to watch the data to be sure everybody's keeping the responsibility, and we take that responsibility on. I'm going to pick on my Pennsylvania colleagues. This is their past progress. Here's what the partnership is indicating they need to be. They're not there in terms of the, their, their trajectory. We hold them. We hold Virginia, we hold Maryland and others accountable for doing that. We not only do that, but we actually give you green, yellow, and red. And if you can understand that colors, you can understand where there's an, uh, an increased oversight, in this case, on our Pennsylvania colleagues in other parts of the watershed. But in addition to this, we also are doing um, each of the states in terms of looking at their offset programs. We are looking at it, have done one assessment, we're in the process of doing another one. So we are watching how the trading fits in there, how market-based programs fit in there um, to ensure that not only are we reducing the weight of, of that uh, watershed on the Chesapeake, that those changes in, pollut in pollutant loads due to, to changes in growth and land use, we want to be sure states have got systems in place to do that. And we're, we're going to produce similar charts to this to say how is each state doing to make that happen. These market-based approaches fit nicely and well right into that particular system. So do we have, do we got that science? I think we do. We know where those loads are, where the sources are, and we're going to have that much better of a system coming up in the next year. We know what the, the, for 368 going up to 400 individual practices and a system for bringing other ones, what their loads, what their, their uh, estimated pollution reduction potential is. We know how to transport them. It's, again, it's not perfect. It's not magic. It's good, solid land-grant university science that gets it into there. And then we understand H. You could look at your home watershed, you could go way up into the Chemung in New York, and we know where those loads influence our Chesapeake Bay uh, waters and the local waters along the way. So we have the tools, I think, necessary to put in place, and we have the accountability system. You all are putting it at the local scale, but the partnership's got good science-based end goals. We know what a clean Chesapeake Bay is. We know how to measure that across the four jurisdictions out there. We have the ability to quantifiably link a wastewater treatment plant a farm over, uh, not a farm, but an agricultural area over here, an urban area over here, and where those loads are going along the way and who they're influencing as they work their way down. And, for, and finally, probably one of the more important thing is we have a system in place where we are uh, make, holding each other accountable in terms of not only having the practices on the ground and verifying them, but the programs and the ability to then say, yes, they're working the way that we need to. And if you're not working the way you need to, from a public perspective, from a holding of funding, from taking regulatory actions. We don't want to do that, but we have that ability in place as well. So I think we got science, we got accountability. You all need to, let's have that continued dialogue of, does that match with what you need to have in place to then go for a market-based solution? Thank you. I know it's break time, but I think it might be important just to take a couple questions that have been received for Rich to answer them, and then I will take the ones that haven't been answered and combine them with the initial ones we received, and we'll make sure we keep the questions in front of the panelists. Rich, would you take, say, five minutes and do that? Sure. And we'll extend the break by five minutes. So I'm standing between you and coffee. John Griffin, can you hold it out, buddy? Yeah, I know they're going to try to find uh, his folder back in the, um, the men's room there. So as, uh, the next first question is, what is needed of a water quality monitoring program to ensure that a nutrient trading program works? What level of resolution would be needed, especially in agricultural watersheds? That's a great question. 
I think it, it gets down to if you're looking in a watershed, you have one or two trades in there, you know, we're not going to see it in our models. We're not going to see it in our monitoring data. Remember, these are, even though we have 120 stations, that's a big watershed out there. But I think the way that we've got this monitoring system set up, think of starting at the, the nine major river basins. So let's start on the, on the Potomac itself. So we've got a station in there that's sort of the big faucet coming from all the watershed coming into that point uh, right above Washington, D.C. Then as you move up that river system, the states working with USGS and others, we put stations on where we've got the major rivers, and as you go up there, and then where are the other rivers across from that. So two or three times up, we we're trying to capture where those major rivers are. We also, God forbid, we put stations where one state meets another. You can see that. We humans, we're crazy, but Mother Nature doesn't care about that line. So, but we can say, is one state influencing the other? We've also set up these, water, these monitoring systems not just to be characteristic of the river itself. We've made particular places where it's a very ag-dominated system, one that's almost completely forested, one that's being influenced by acid mine drainage, one that's really heavily uh, urbanized if you go into Fairfax County, so that we can learn from the practices that are being put in that watershed how that watershed is responding. So I think it's not perfect. It's a great question, but I do believe given the resources that we can share amongst the, the six states and the district, the federal partners, local partners, in this monitoring network, we are probably primed and ready to be able to see to the degree we're going to see the resolution of the change because of how we structure that. Did we set it up for a, a market-based approach? No. But we did set it up for an accountability and the ability to then say, are you actually seeing a response to what's happening in that particular system? Can we add more stations? We'd love to. And one of the initiatives we have underway is working with citizens, monitors, watershed organizations to try to fill that network out, and I think that can help as well. The low-cost BMP implement installation be built for credits in, irrespective of actual nitrogen reductions. So can low-cost BMPs installed be built for credits irrespective of nitrogen reductions? I'm not sure if I understand that question. Um, how do you expect the nutrient reduction models to change due to changes in precipitation caused by climate change? Um, Actually, what we're seeing now, if you actually look at the record, we are experiencing climate change in the Chesapeake already. The tidal waters, according to our scientists at Virginia Marine Science University of Maryland, have changed at least one to two degrees. That's not, that's not some you know, big event out there. That's us from the 1930s to where we're now. So we've, the tidal waters have warmed up. We've actually started to see more intensive storms out there. So our monitoring system out there is actually capturing that. So our suite of models, which are calibrated and verified from 1985 up to about two or three years ago, capture these great events. I love it. My USGS colleagues are wonderful. I've in my lifetime lived through about 10 to 1500 year storms. I'm not as old as Verna Harrison, my God. Um, but we've seen intensive storms. We also see a, saw an 18 month drought that the Chesapeake came close to meeting water quality standards, but my neighbors and my farmers and others couldn't have enough out there. So yes, We've actually built climate change into the calibration period, and part of Lee Curry and, and uh, Dave Montali's job on behalf of the partnership is to actually build in climate change capacity so we can actually look out into the future. We're looking at probably a 2050 time period of what's happening in the mid-Atlantic, and can we get prepared for that? Can we look into that? But an excellent question, and yes, you're going to see the, the journey of how we build that into what we've got. Based on the proposed regulation, how do you plan to incorporate new and inventive innovative BMP practices that are approved by the Chesapeake Bay program but are not land-based. We're going to go through the same process. Oysters is an example. We've got a panel of oyster scientists from around the, the, uh, the watershed. It's act, they're going to look at oysters in terms of if you um, put them spat on shell and hung them in the water, you're going to put them down on the, on the bottom. They're going to look at the different mechanisms. They're going to look at if you remove that oyster or that oyster was helping influence and remove nitrogen normally. It's going to be looked at as a BMP. The partnership needs to then say, hey, listen, how do we verify that? How do we credit that? How do we deal with in situ and consider that as well? So yes, in situ practices, non-land-based ones, if the partnership agrees and if there's mechanisms for tracking, reporting, verifying it, and ensuring that we understand that source, it could be captured in there. But again, that's going to be a partnership decision. Okay. Thank you, Rich. It's break time. If you would be back here promptly by 11.20, and if the panel that is to be
coming up next would be already up front at that time. It would be terrific. Thank you.